So as people join us here today, welcome. Uh, we got to think about the Facebook Live folks and the people who are joining us on Facebook after this. So welcome to the replay for those of you who are here afterwards. Uh, welcome to the live session for those of you who are joining us here today. I appreciate you uh, you coming in. And as people stream in here, we'll, uh, we'll give a few seconds to to let people jump in and, uh, and, and keep, keep filling in the boat here. Um, I hope that your Wednesday is going well and that, uh, that this is a, a profitable week with tons of productivity. At least that's what I continually wish for myself at the beginning of every week. Right. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, so let's uh, let, let's jump in here because we've got a lot to we've got a lot to cover. So uh, thank you so much for joining uh, to, for today's community table discussion: uh, How to effectively use email to grow your business. My name is Ian Campbell, and I'm the CEO of Mission Suite. And joining me today uh, again is Dean Isaacs, founder of and founder and CEO of Vantage Group, and Adrian Savage, founder of Deliverability Dashboard. I'm going to introduce those both of those guys a little bit deeper in a minute. But before we do jump in, just to address a couple housekeeping items, um, we're going to be taking uh, questions throughout the session today, as always. And we're going to be opening up to, you know, kind of a more general Q&A at the end. Uh, if you do have questions throughout, uh, definitely, you know, kind of get them written out while you're thinking of them. Use the Q&A function inside of Zoom. It's going to be that's going to be a more uh, that's going to be a better way to, to, to get us those questions than uh, than using chat or something like that. So use that use that Q&A section there um, and we will be able to. Uh, excuse me, we'll be able to get your questions answered. Um, so first of all, Dean uh, has been my partner in this uh, community table for almost a year now. Can you believe it's been almost a year here? Likewise, man. I know, man, I'll tell you. Uh, Dean is a serial entrepreneur. He's got over 20 years of hands-on business growth, sales and marketing experience. Uh, he works with B2B companies across the US, uh, ranging from startups to Fortune 500. And he loves helping small and mid-sized businesses achieve their growth goals by developing and implementing high impact sales, marketing and growth strategies. Um, and uh, and so Adrian here, uh, Adrian is, is joining us today because he is, uh, I think the father of email actually, right? I mean, <laughs> something like that. Um, Adrian. <laughs> Uh, Adrian left the corporate world uh, 10 years ago and first became a marketing automation consultant, uh, built a successful business inside of a couple of years, uh, in spite of having no website, no business cards, and doing very little direct marketing, which, uh, which I've always found interesting. Every time that I talk to Adrian, I try and get a little bit deeper into that. Um, but uh, in recent years, he's actually niched down into the world of email deliverability. Uh, he's helped clients send more than a billion emails and knows exactly what needs to be done to avoid the spam folder and actually get people's attention, which is makes him a perfect fit for this uh, this conversation. He's advised many well-known companies, including the Shark Group, uh, when they wanted to maximize their email performance. His unique race method shows you exactly what you need to do to double your, your open rates and be heard by more of your audience. Um, and so I am really excited for this conversation and I appreciate you both for, uh, for, for being here again today. Thanks, Ian. Appreciate it. I'm looking forward to hearing Adrian and um, what you have to say today as well. Yeah, it's going to be a good session. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Adrian, Dean and I have been doing this for, you know, about a year now. So they've, everybody's heard, uh, heard it quite a bit from us, but do you want to kind of give a little bit more backstory into, uh, into where you're coming from and the, the yeah, experience that you bring sure to the table? So, yeah, I've been a geek since I was about seven years old. So if anyone was old enough to remember the original Apple II computer, that was the first thing I played on. My dad brought one of those home. Um, he got pretty close to throwing it out the window, but I was geeky enough back then to read the manual, learn how to do it, teach dad how to use the computer. So that was me kind of cast as a geek forevermore. So I did the usual things, go to school, uh, learn how to make money for other people, and then um, escape the corporate world about 10 years ago, um, learn all about marketing. Um, I was in a mastermind group where all the other people were being taught about marketing and online automation and stuff like that. They all looked like a rabbit caught in the headlamps and they was going, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. And I was the one going, hey, this sounds pretty cool. So they started asking me what to do. I started helping them and that was that. And then a few years later, I started getting clients who couldn't get their emails into the inbox. Um, to start with, I lost a few clients along the way as I was learning how this stuff works. 
but I was one of the few people in the world who was kind of geek enough and into this enough to actually really get down into the weeds and work out what was going on. Um, started writing software to solve problems for people. Um, and then I guess it must be three or four years ago now, you know, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, they started to really change the rules of how email works. And bearing in mind, these guys control three quarters of the world's inboxes now. Then if they set the rules, you got to listen. So I started studying that, working with other people who know similar kinds of things develop more software. Um, here we are a few years later and I went, I kind of ignored those messages. You know how the universe sometimes tell you you want to go in a certain direction and you ignore it and you ignore it and then it ends up dropping a piano on you before you get the message? Um, that, that was kind of me. Um, but a couple of years ago, I ditched everything else. All that I do now is email deliverability, how to get more emails into the inbox, how to avoid the spam folder, and you know, creating my own software, working with people at the kind of high-end private consulting, everything in between, and loving every minute of it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. That's uh, That gives us some good, uh, good perspective. And it also kind of dovetails nicely into our first question of the day. Um, you know, people, we hear a lot that email is dead or email is dying and what have you, right? And, you know, in no small part, I'm sure, because Outlook, Gmail, and uh, well, Verizon Media Group is uh, owns v uh, Yahoo and AOL and all that. You know, I mean, and so they, oh, they do control so much of the world's email inboxes and whatnot. And uh, people just don't seem to know how to how to run run across them, and I'm wondering if that's you know beyond that, right? Why do why do we keep hearing that email is dead or email is dying? Do you guys have any any thoughts on that? Well, I'm waiting for Dean to go in. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think it's it's the easy answer is social media, right? Mm -hmm. People just assume that one channel of communication replaces another channel of commun communication. And social media is there, it's on our phones, much like email, but it's everywhere, right? It, it invades every part of our life. And so the natural um, assumption is, well, email's dying. It's not working. It's not, it's not going to be effective anymore. But the truth of the story is that's just not the case. I mean, you look at all of the statistics out there, it, it actually shows the opposite. Um, so it's just not dying, right? That, that's the fact. But if you think about what's the goal of email, it's purely it's a communication tool. That's all it is, right? We want to get our message in front of the right people and cause a reaction. And so I don't think of it in terms of dying. I think of it, how can we leverage these different channels and different mechanisms to get the ultimate result? So um, if you believe it's dying, then go play on, you know, um, um, you know, any of the old dying social media platforms, you know, uh, MySpace is what I try to come up with there. You know, <laughs> MySpace died. Yeah, it now continues. All right. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, a lot of the people who want to kill email off are the ones that have got some, some kind of vested interest either in another social media platform or more often not, it's the guys who are training people how to use these other platforms. And the thing is, I'm always going to be very clear that email is not the only game in town. It works at its best when you use a multi-channel approach. If you can use social media, direct mail, text message, whatever it is, email is really important, but you need to use other things as well but let's remember email has got you know right now there are more than four billion email users worldwide um, you know there's around 300 billion emails every single day being sent at the moment um, which is absolutely crazy you know the volume of email is growing even 16 year olds still use email because they have to you can't set up an Instagram account without email you can't reset your password without email so even the Millennials and the youngsters that don't want to use email they still have to because that's the only way that you can actually prove that you're you a lot of the time so it's there for everybody um, and and I think the issue is a lot of people don't realize how much it has changed as long as you know it's a bit like search engine optimization if you remember 10 years ago the glory days it was so easy to be number one on Google um, but they got cleverer and cleverer and cleverer and suddenly you couldn't just have a million backlinks pointing to your website anymore you had to have decent content and then they kept changing the rules and changing the rules and email has gone the same way um, you know, take Google as the best example the majority of their users don't pay for the email platform so Google have to make their money out of 
of advertising and they only get to make their money displaying adverts if someone opens an email. So guess what? They're going to reward the people that, the, who are sending the emails that get opened and they're going to penalise the people sending out all this garbage that people don't want to read. So it means that we've got to pay attention to what Google are looking for and Microsoft and Yahoo as well. And as long as we understand that, then we are going to still absolutely crush it. We've got people, you know, I'm getting a 40 to 45 percent open rate with my own emails that I send out. Um, my clients are getting between 35 and 55 percent open rates. So email is definitely not dying. You've just got to be careful what you're doing. It's as simple as that. And as long as you do that, it's going to work. And the other thing with email is you're not going to get banned by some social media despot. Um, you know, love him or hate him. Ex-President Trump had a big platform on social media. Where is he now? He cannot communicate with the world and he had no control over that. Now, he's got an email list as well. Guess what? Those emails are still going out. It's just that he's lost his main platform. So, you know, email, even if you end up in Google jail for a little bit because you do something dumb and you go and swim in Lake Stupid for a bit, it doesn't matter because you can actually rescue yourself. You can get back into the good books as long as you clean up your act. You know, it's going to be very difficult for someone to ban you from email because worst case, you will just set up another email address or something like that. So, you know, with email, you've got a lot more control. It's not like Facebook. It's not like Instagram. It's not like Twitter, you know, where if they change the algorithm, then you're screwed. With email, as long as you have trained your audience to engage with you, it doesn't matter how much the algorithm has changed, your audience will keep looking for you. That is why email is so important. And even if you've got, you know, whether you're using Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, it doesn't matter. Email is just a single core part of that. And email cannot die. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you bring up an interesting point. I mean, because, you know, in, uh, irrespective of, you know, being banned from the social channels, you can bet that Donald Trump's emails are still being opened. Yeah, right? absolutely. And so, yeah. And I mean, so he, just because he, and which, and my next question was going to be focused on, you know, why shouldn't I just start emailing people directly through Facebook Messenger, Instagram DMs, Twitter DMs and whatnot, right? And so obviously one of which is that if you, you, know, you touched on one point that if you get banned by those people, then you can't, you don't have that channel anymore. Yep. Is there anything beyond that, that uh, that's more important or th that, that we want to be thinking about as to why we should be focusing on email instead of the other messenger apps that seem to get dir uh, get more di more directly to the to a user's uh, hands? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say instead of I think, you know, like I said just now, you know, the multi channel approach is really cool because you are more likely to reach people via, you know, text message is still the most opened medium, something like 80 something percent, I think. But you'll be so careful with text message because if you send something and people don't like it, they're going to complain and you could get shut down really quickly. You know, sending marketing garbage via SMS is a big no, no these days. And I know that in the US in particular, AT&T and T-Mobile are really changing how they're going to be processing business text messages from now on. I think we're just reaching that kind of cusp point where they're changing the rules and making you pay a bit more. Um, and similar, you know, Facebook Messenger. Facebook have got so many rules around what you can and what you can't send. And if you break those rules and get too many complaints, again, they're going to shut you down. But it doesn't hurt to get those different contact details because if you can reach someone via text or via Facebook Messenger or whatever, then you are likely to, to be a bit more effective reaching those people. But the thing is, what you can send in a text message or a Facebook message is fundamentally different from what you're going to send in email. Email, you know, I don't, I'm not a fan of great big sending war and peace novels by email. That's kind of, you know, that, that's, that's so last year now. But you can still send more in an email than you can in something like Facebook Messenger. So again, it's like, you know, use the right tool for the right job. If you want to send someone a quick reminder saying that the webinar is starting or this event or whatever, then text or Facebook Messenger or something that's going to ping into their straight onto their phone, that's ideal. If you're sending someone a little bit of a nurture email, building a relationship or tr educating them or something, or even making an offer, that's where email is so much better because it's not quite so much in your face. It's not so intrusive. So really, it's always about using the right tool for the right job. Email is not the only game in town. I would certainly consider using text messages in certain cases or instant message or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree 100%, Adrian. I think it depends on also what na the nature of your business and who your customer is as well. So if you're in a B2C business and you, you're selling commodities really quickly, you've got a quick flash offer, maybe a, a, a message on a social platform is good. You hit, they hit the landing page, they swipe up, they buy, they're done, right? 
that's a different transaction, different experience, a different customer journey, right? So most of the clients I work with are, are businesses. It's B2B. It's a long and complex um, sale. And yep. you can't sell like that with an IM, regardless of which channel it's on, right? So moving that, that audience from that social platform to a landing page for a download, get them to opt in, and then nurture that relationship with a very meaningful journey is, is a much easier, more effective way to convert. And then you have control over that process. You don't have any control on the social platforms, whether that stuff's going to get blocked, banned, delivered or not. Um, so I think that it really think I try and align the, the, the tool and the message with the purpose and where they're at in the, where the uh, buyer's at in the buyer's journey as well. But ultimately, you don't own anything on social media, right? It, you, you've just given it away. As soon as you post it, or, or it's gone. But you have control with email. You own your list. And your email, a good nurtured email list, is one of the most valuable assets any business can have. Totally. So all of those other channels should help you nurture and build that list. And we'll get into the list building here in a little bit. But uh, that's the goal is to build that list because that's where the dollars are. Yeah. Especially in B2B. Yeah, because I mean, I remember, uh, I don't know, this is maybe six or seven years ago now, reading a story about uh, a woman who had built, uh, not even really built a business, but just built an email newsletter and sold that, that, that database and that newsletter for something like $20 million. I mean, it was, and I might be exaggerating. I might be exaggerating. I don't remember, but I might be just, you know, kind of expand, blowing it up in my mind. But it was, a, it was a, it was a huge number. I mean, she had something like, you know, two hundred thousand email subscribers that were on this thing that were actually engaged email subscribers, and she ended up selling it for a ridiculous amount of money. Yeah. And you know, so you know, to your point, owning that list, I, th I feel like is a really big uh, is a really big thing to focus on, especially if you're kind of looking at the looking at the options like that. Yeah, yeah. In the M and A world, there are, they never thought about that stuff before when they valued a business, but now the value of the relationship isn't just in the transaction, but it's in the size of your reach. Mm -hmm. You know, I've mm -hmm. seen businesses get bought just because of their market presence. Mm -hmm. Right, they're running at a loss. Right, it. Facebook before they started selling ads, right? Mm -hmm. What the, what was the valuation of Facebook before they started selling ads? It was ridiculous. And they didn't necessarily, well, they had emails because you had to have an email in the system to sign into Facebook. But nonetheless, they own that list. They own that kind of piece of the world. And that's what an email list is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's start talking about building uh, building out that email list. Uh, um, <clears throat> you know, obviously there are good ways to do this and bad ways to do this, uh, and then really bad ways to do this. Uh, so, <laughs> so you know, just starting off, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the more effective ways that you've seen people build a list. And Dean, you kind of brought uh, you you kind of brought it uh, uh, dovetailed into this. So we'll kind of start with you. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I would start out by saying. Avoid buying a list at all costs. And I, I know, Adrian, you're probably going to jump right on that because of deliverability. But there are times where a list is maybe kind of acceptable-ish, if, maybe. But 99% of the time, you want to build a list. And there, if even if it's just because of deliverability, right, and selling, sending stuff that's going to be listed as spam. And Adrian, you can speak to that here in a second. But it's so easy to be lured into buying a list. And they say it's this, it's been cleaned, it's been verified. It's not your list. You don't know these people. They don't know you. There is no reason for them to open your stuff. But there's every reason for them to hit spam. And then you get blacklisted really quickly. So just want to say that. But in terms of building a list, it's really about building a relationship, right? It's about getting your brand out there, getting your message out there, and trying to create an interaction and, and the, at the core of that, I believe, are using a tool called a lead magnet. And a lead magnet, in its essence, a piece of valuable information that somebody's willing to share their email address to get, right? And we've all done it. We've got the email. We've got the, the hit on a landing page. And it's download Ian's best tips for selecting a CRM. I need that. I'm in the market for a CRM. I'm going to give you my phone number and email address. Or my, my name, maybe not even my phone number, maybe my first name and my email is all I am willing to give. I'll exchange that for that download. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing a lot of marketers forget and a lot of business owners forget is that's not where the relationship ends. That's where the relationship really begins. So you know they're interested in buying a CRM because they just downloaded this white paper, best tips to buy this thing. So 
you want to then nurture that relationship and then you, you want to, and, and maybe we'll talk about this a little later, but have a thoughtful series of interactions via email that follow up that first download. But that, that um, lead magnet can come in a lot of different forms. It can be premium video content. It could be um, a download. It could be a tips and tricks. It could be access to a, another page on a website. Anything that's of value, content of value that um, really resonates with that person. They have to exchange something and they exchange their email for yeah. that information. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Adrian, do you have anything to add about at, uh, building those lists? Yeah, I absolutely love that. Agree with every single thing. We'll talk about buying lists and that in a minute because also I've seen that Jason's asked a really cool question that kind of segues in from this and we'll come back to that. Um, but yeah, I, you know, Dean absolutely hit the nail on the head. You know, the, the whole point of having an email list is that these are the people that want to build a relationship with you. You can build a relationship with them. Lead Magnet is awesome. Um, and we'll probably give an example of that later on because I've got a really, a really cool one that would that would probably be worth, worth sharing. Um, but once someone has just asked for that information then they're saying please tell me more about this they they want to learn so you know that as long as you know so one of the ways you can go and dive deep into lake stupid is when someone asks for your lead magnet you'll start you effectively propose marriage on the first date and say hey buy all my stuff you're not going to do that we're going to we're going to build a relationship with people and email is the perfect way of doing that um because you've got to remember that a customer a customer will only buy when they're ready to buy it doesn't matter when you're ready to sell to them you've got to be ready for them to want to buy maybe the very second they've first found you maybe a month three months 12 months later and the thing you've got to do is it's called front of mind awareness the more emails you send out to nurture that relationship to build you know to add value and just build on that relationship the more consistently you do that, the more you will stay in your audience's minds. And then when they're ready to make that purchase, it's going to be you they come to rather than one of your competitors because you are the one that has actually really built that relationship with them. So it's all about giving massive value in that lead magnet. You're just giving it all away for free. You give your best stuff away if possible because they're going to really be impressed. They're going to want to listen for more of what you've got. And then just keep adding value, keep adding value. And then you know, as long as you've got the balance Balance between value versus offers right you can make offers as, as often as you want um, in the month of February this year I sent an offer out to my email list every single day and the reason I got away with that is because I was sharing a story I was teaching something and the offer was just a little afterthought at the end of the email and that worked really well it's no coincidence that February was my highest revenue ever um, because I was doing that and you know people don't mind receiving offers as long as they're getting something else as well and then if they're seeing this little reminder say hey this is right for me they'll click through they'll do something if not they've still got value because you're building that relationship with them so you know get people to consume that lead magnet and you know you can send paid traffic to a landing page facebook ads google ads whatever you can do organic posts there's so many ways of getting people to find you um there's no coincidence that I'm appearing on a lot of podcasts at the moment um, and that is a great way for people to suddenly find out more about me and I'm finding that even though I've stopped paying for all my Facebook ads and things like that I'm still getting even more people signing up to my list than ever because I'm just getting the message out there as much as possible so I think you know that's that's a really really important thing and the thing the thing with all of this is that it doesn't matter how important your actual products and services are, then unless you're investing in maintaining that relationship with your audience, then effectively you're letting your business dwindle and die. Yes, sometimes it can take a lot of either time or money to build your audience. But the thing to remember is on average, an email list is going to decline by about 10% a month um, because people just switch off. So you can't just take this this email asset that you've got for granted you have to look after it and you know let's 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 accept that any business has to spend time and money on marketing and sales if, if a business doesn't do marketing and sales there will be no business in a few years you know there's a, there's a few exceptions to that like you know maybe a cpa or something like that where you have to have someone but even they need to make sure that they get their business rather than the competitors there's always something you've got to do so i think even though yes it takes a lot of resource to 
to add that value, then you can do it yourself, you can outsource it. And you know, every single client I've ever worked with that have increased the amount of communication they send by email, then they have seen a massive return on investment in that time and energy they've spent. So yes, it can be a lot of work, but it is absolutely worth it without a shadow of a doubt. Dean, you were gonna say? The most recent statistic I saw was it's a 44 to one ratio of return on investment when you spend money on email marketing, mm -hmm. 44 to one. I mean, that's yeah. anytime you can spend a dollar and get 44 back, you're going right. to probably do that. And then you're going to put more money in the machine. So I think it's, it, it just, the statistics continue to show that it's a really good way to, to um, direct some of your marketing activity, some of your marketing focus and some of your marketing dollars. Yeah. You know, and I mean, obviously, you know, the uh, email is one of the least expensive ways to market, right? And uh, overall, I mean, because, uh, but, you know, and building that list and, and, to, and to Jason, you know, Jason uh, mentioned a question here uh, that, you know, keeping, keep continuing to add value takes a lot of resources, which takes away from the business, right? The, the actual business of doing the business. Um, and, uh, I probably said that wrong, but I think the, 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 I, I think we get the point. Um, uh, but, uh, but, you know, and it does, you know, for sure. And that's, but that building the list, it tends to be the most, most kind of, uh, cost consuming part of it. Um, and Adrian, you kind of touched on, uh, the idea of partnerships, right. Be, uh, showing up on podcasts and whatnot. Uh, can you guys kind of, uh, both kind of talk a little bit about the idea of using partnerships to build your email list, whether that's, you know, uh, partnering with, uh, I don't know, partnering with a shoe company to, so that, you know, and, and doing a contest together so that you both get the email list or so, things like that. Is there value to that? Is that more on the, in the gray side? Where, where does that fall? And, and how can we use, how can we use stuff, things like that effectively? I've seen so many examples of, you know, joint ventures, partnerships, things like that. And as long as they're done ethically and they're focusing on the value, then it can't go wrong because it should be a win-win. You know, if you find someone who's already got an established audience, if you can add value to that audience, then they will be happy to share your message or pr promote a competition, whatever it is. And in return, then you get access to those people as long as they've said they're happy to have that access. And if you do that, then then, then it's, it's brilliant. You know, I've, I've seen car companies partner with health spas and crazy things like that, where they will, you know, they, they will offer, um, you know, a, a, a free free trip to the spa when you have a service or something like that. And they will just start sharing, you know, they'll, they'll promote each other. So they don't even have to be related businesses sometimes. There's so so many different ways or you know the best example I've seen is in the personal development world you know you've got all the the Tony Robbinses of this world and the people in those kind of circles they all promote the crap out of each other um, and the reason they do it is because they know that their audience will want what the person they know is offering and the other way around so even though these guys could be seen as competitors they all buddy up they promote each other because you know they all believe in abundance and you know there's enough people out there for everyone and and, and the proof of the pudding is in the eating they make these promotions and their customers buy these other people's stuff and it just keeps going on and you just grow you know you grow your audience you're sharing with other people again you're adding value um you know partnerships and, and having a good network of people that you trust to share your message is it's just you know it's priceless it's amazing yeah yeah Ian, you and i talk a lot about referrals and, and building your referral network this is just an extension of that is what i believe um and you know, we all love that one-to-one -one referral when I refer you or you refer me, but what better way than to be referred to a massive list, right? And be able to show up and show your expertise and add value. So I think that's huge. The other piece of this, and Adrian, you brought this up and it, it got me thinking, you know, these, the big Tony Robbins of the world, all of these gurus, if you notice that when they say, go to Adrian's event, it's only 99 bucks and you get a discount, click on this link. That link is an affiliate link. So not yep, only yep. are they sharing the, the, the sort of like um, content wealth, they're getting paid too. Mm -hmm. So they'd be incented to share that content with their list and do it in a very authentic way. So it makes that, that sharing even more effective. And I have no problem with affiliate relationships, right? As long as it's ethical, as long as it's clear and it's, it's above board, it's nothing iffy, I, I'm fine with that. People should be paid for the value they put into the world. So... That's another reason why these gurus do this. There's there's a bunch of folks on on um, one person does um, he his shtick is all about creating online memberships. 
Another person, her shtick is all about building your email list. Another one is all about uh, messaging and content. And you see them promoting this stuff over and over. And every, it's almost like they do their big launches twice a year and they all dovetail every other month. It's like, oh, this month and that month. I mean, when you stand back and look, you see what they're doing, but you know what? It works. Yeah. yeah, and it's absolutely. feeding that common audience with great content. So, yeah, absolutely, all day long. And I feel like that that does have to. There has to be some sort of a story that you can tell, right? I mean, Adrian, you mentioned like the car, the car companies, and the health spas, right? But I mean, you know, and there's there, there's a there's a, there's there's got to be some sort of a path to make to make it make sense. Like Dawn Soap is not going to partner with Exxon Mobil, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, like those types of things are just too completely far apart. You know, I mean, you know, uh, and I'm sure that I could think of plenty of other amusing examples, but uh, but it's got to make some sort of sense at least, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because ultimately, my audience is my audience, mm -hmm. right? And I may I may be willing to cross promote um, something that doesn't align with what I do, but it resonates with my audience. Mm -hmm. So as long as that's the case, and I'm not I'm not disingenuous, right? I'm I'm serving my audience like I've promised. And it may seem a little out left field, but if as long as it's aligned, then it will make more sense um, to the audience as well. And then you don't drive them off because otherwise it feels like I'm being pitched this random crap. Right. And then you just you just burn your own credibility with it with your list too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think re relevance is the key. Um, you know, either relevance or you can be pretty certain that there's some kind of link between the two. Is like you know, if it's a high end car dealership and it's a luxury spa, then if people like nice cars they're probably going to want to pamper themselves and things like that so you know so you so you you'd need to make sure that there's some kind of alignment but it's like dean said as long as you know and this is one of the most important tips i've ever heard from another email deliverability expert is know thine audience and the better you know your audience and the better you know as much as you can about them, what they're looking for, what they need, what their pain points are, um, all of those things, you can then make sure you're sharing the right things, whether that's your content, whether it's someone else's value, whatever it is, it's just know your audience and just keep sending them what they need. And by the way, if you don't know your audience well enough, then one of the best types of email you can send is asking them what you need. Send them a little survey or a little email. Uh, if the audience is small enough and you can handle this, ask them to reply to you and things like that. All of those things, then they build that relationship further. They give people a reason to engage with you and you get amazing information back because you, you might guess what you think your audience needs, but until you actually get some hard data back from them then you, you're just shooting in the dark until then mm -hmm. so you know the more you can learn the better and that's why email is so cool because you can actually see what people are doing as well so another really strong point for using email yeah let's talk a little bit about quality versus quantity um and i think adrian i think you had one of the best lines that i've heard when you and you and i talked in the past that you know guys want to have the guys tend to want to have the bigger stronger bigger you know bigger, bigger lists well women tend to be more focused on no just make sure that it's the right people that i'm talking to and everything will take care of themselves and i don't know how accurate that is i mean i'm, I'm assuming that that must be pretty accurate but uh you know those of us in the marketing sphere uh, now know that that qual the quality of the list and engagement factor of the list, uh, and this is something that we've talked about briefly, we've touched on briefly here, uh, is, is significantly more important than the number of people that are on the list, right? Yeah. And th this is the biggest thing that has changed in the recent years because mm -hmm. you know, go back five, six, seven years, the halcyon days where all you had to do was build the biggest list you could, <laughs> just get as many people on there, and then you just mail the hell out of them as often as you can until they buy, they die, or they unsubscribe. Um, and guess what? There's a few marketers that still do that now, and they wonder why they've got a 3% open rate. Right. Um, and you know that, that, that's how it used to work. Um, whereas now, and it is interesting because it has, you know, and maybe this is just my experience, I won't make any gender bias comments as such here, but I have had a much stronger challenge getting men to let go of the parts of their email list that no longer serve them. Because now it's all about only sending emails to the people that actually want to hear from you. And the only way you know someone wants to hear from you is if they're opening your emails. It's as simple as that. If they're not opening your emails, they're voting with your feet. And it would be crazy to keep trying to just, you know, what was it, Einstein, I think, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. So let's just keep emailing these people that don't open because, yeah, maybe it will change. Well, you know headline news most of them don't if someone hasn't opened something in three months 
the vast majority of them never will again. So it's time to, and I'm going to get my, my reference to the Disney Frozen movie, and I manage it every time. You've got to let it go. You've got to <laughs> let it go. <laughs> There is no point flogging a dead horse. I mean, I know, I, I understand it hurts. Some people might pay as much as 20 30 even $50 per lead if they're on paid traffic. You know, if it's some really difficult niche like weight loss or something else where there's a lot of competition and you're paying a lot of paid for traffic to get an email lead, then people are going to be really reluctant to let go of their hard-earned money that they're seeing in this database. But mm -hmm. if, someone hasn't, if someone hasn't engaged with you in, in a while, if they haven't opened anything, unfortunately, that value goes down very, very quickly. Um, so you've got to make sure... more in the long run, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because the more you send emails to these unengaged people now, the more your sending reputation is going to get hurt. Google actually let you check out your own reputation. They've got something called Postmaster Tools. And you can see that if you're not doing things very well, then you'll go very quickly from high down to medium, down to low. And then you've got the, the lowest of the low they call bad. And if you're down at low or bad, it means that pretty much all the emails you're sending are going to spam by that point. And I've worked with one client. They got themselves into Google jail to the, to the point where they were getting a 0.25% open rate with the emails they were sending. Wow. And, all, and it was because they had just, they, they had just spammed the hell out of their list. They burnt it to a cinder. They just kept mailing all kinds of garbage. Um, they didn't care what they were sending. And then here's the real sting in the tail. They tried setting up a new email domain. <laughs> they started sending from it. And it was really funny because on day one, their Google Postmaster rating on this new domain was high. Day two, medium. Day three, low. Day four, bad. Google joined up the dots. They followed them around. Google are cleverer than we are, folks. You've yeah. just got to play by the rules. You can't just send garbage out anymore. And the better you can maintain that email list, the better you can start pruning off those people that aren't opening stuff, it's going to make such a difference. Mm -hmm. That is what makes the difference between a really effective email marketer and someone who's just doing it the same way as they were five years ago. Yeah. Um, change that one habit, and that's going to transform the way that email works. And those are the people that say that email is, isn't dead. The ones that haven't changed their habits, guess what they they can see that email's dead because they haven't changed with it you've yeah. got to evolve if not if you don't evolve then darwin was right you evolve or you die simple as that yeah, yeah. it's dead for them i have to chuckle while you're talking Adrian, because jason is dropping a few que uh, questions in yeah. the q a and so he said he's one of those guys huge email list reluctant to let go and then he follows up with what do i do with them won't they need my service at some point in the future Jason, the answer is no, dude. <laughs> Un unfortunately, yeah, that's it, exactly it. Maybe, maybe some of them might have just been tire kickers and looky loos anyway. But the thing is, people's circumstances change. Um, now, it may be in the future some of them might come back. But the thing is, if they need it that much, they will probably find you again. Um, I mean, a lot of th th this is why I love sending out lots of emails and lots of content. And I actually tell lots of stories about me because I'm building a personal relationship with my list. And I know that I turn quite a few people off. They get upset, they unsubscribe. And I have a little celebration every time someone unsubscribes because they are saving me the trouble of having to go and root them out and unsubscribe them myself when they don't engage with me. I would rather, you know, email marketing is just like sales. A yes is really cool, but a no is just as good. We want people to say no. All those people that are just ignoring us, they are hurting our reputation. I mean, sure, you can save those email addresses. You might use Facebook retargeting and various other things and, you know, and have a little go every now and then just to wave something in front of them. But, you know, the, 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 the stats that I've seen working with my clients is if you send an email to the people that haven't engaged for 90 days or longer, you're going to get at best a 2% open rate. If you send it to the people that haven't engaged for a year or longer, you're going to get less than a 1% open rate. But every time you keep mailing those people frequently, then you're going to be hurting your reputation and you'll find that 10 to 15% of your engaged warm contacts aren't going to see your email anymore because Google decide that you're sending garbage out and they start rerouting you to the spam folder. Yeah. So, you know, yes, there's always going to be a tiny percentage that might need it in the future, but they will get totally eclipsed by the currently engaged group and they're the ones you need to focus on. That's why, you know, it, but, but I, I, I understand where Jason's coming from. You can have a huge email list and it's like, you know, 
People, people sweat blood to build that email list. They spend tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars. There is a massive value in that list. The good news is the ones that are still active will more than make up for the ones that you've lost. Yeah. You know, if you focus on those active people, um, then the chances are you are going to make, you're going to get amazing results out of those. I was absolutely dumbfounded when I sent my daily emails out in February, the number of people that actually went through and bought something I was offering, some was low value, some was high value, and people, I just had no expectation how many people would show interest. And here's the crazy thing, this was just buying by clicking through. Because I've been focused on so many different things, I haven't actually had a salesperson follow up with the people that clicked and didn't buy, which is insanity, you know, shoot me right now kind of thing. Um, you know, there's, there's always more resource that you can throw at your engaged content. I think that's the thing to bear in mind. So yeah, it is a, it's a psychological challenge to let go of this stuff. And I totally get it. I've had this conversation with so many people, but I have never, ever seen the numbers and the figures and the data prove otherwise. If you focus on the people that have engaged recently, then you're going to get great results. Every time you just pull out the unengaged people and see how they perform, you're going to find that it's minuscule. Yes, you'll get a sale or two, but, but the collateral damage from doing that is massive. What was that movie? He's just not that into you. <laughs> right? Something like that, right? <laughs> Let's see how many movie references we can get into one yeah. session. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, it's not you, it's me, because I'm sending you garbage content, right? Right. The truth is, is that I think that's, we have to look inwardly first, right? Mm. I, you can't blame your list if you're sending out garbage, right? Stuff that has no relevancy, no value, nothing. It's not going to compel me to keep opening that stuff. I am not going to open it. But somebody posted, Shannon posted um, in the chat about kind of this opportunistic sale, I guess, right? In, in alternative healthcare, somebody's not sick all the time, so they don't need all my services is kind of how I interpret her comment. Yeah. But you're not trying to sell with every email. You're trying right. to engage an audience and build a relationship with every email. Absolutely. So if you take a step back and say, I'm going to send my monthly email or whatever cadence it is, and there's always going to be stuff of value. People that care about health, and alternative health methods will want to read this stuff because it's informational, it's interesting, it's engaging. They will always open it, and then when they're sick, they'll think of you. But if you think of your email as a sales channel only, you're going to burn the list out, and they're not going to be thinking of you when they're ready to buy. Mm -hmm. So really be conscious of content. What's the purpose of this particular email? Is it is it a thinly veiled sales pitch where you've built no relationship and you don't have a right to ask the business? Or is it offering genuine value first? So I think we spend too much time pitching stuff. Or it's this really like, you can see it's a pitch. It's it's wrapped up in a message, but it's a pitch. Don't do it. People know when they get their garbage. But on the other side of the coin, there are lots of like consumer brands that I follow. When I get their emails and I get the coupon, I buy. I'm just waiting for the coupon before I buy that's a different relationship, right? If you're in a services business, it's not so transactional. So you don't have that same luxury of the weekly coupon code. It's That's not who your audience is. Don't do that. Don't think of your list that way. So mm. don't sell on every, it, it just happened. That, that's probably, I think, the biggest reason people don't open the emails is because yeah, just people, people don't want to be sold all the time people want value they want content and you know some kind you know like alternative healthcare then that's the perfect audience because typically someone who's into reiki or other things like that then there's going to be a whole variety of things that you can just share it can be your opinion about things it could be educational things it could be stories there can be just so many different things you can share and you know as someone who I, I respect massively in the email space said in this day and age you really need to be sending out at least one email a week to your audience we've reached that point now um, and you know, if you can't think of 50 different things to say in a year, then are you really the expert in that in that industry? You know, there's 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 got to be. I mean, I mean, sometimes I think that I struggle what to say. But if I if, if I go through a transcript of everything that I've said today, there's probably about a dozen emails already that just come right. out without me even thinking about this stuff. We'll get um, you a recording of this episode here, and then you get you. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. But that's this is the thing. Just in you know, everyday conversations, there is you know there are gems coming out all the time, and sometimes you don't even realise because something that took me a long time to get my head around is all the stuff that just feels like a traffic safety lecture to me. Um, 
and other people will listen and say, wow, this actually makes sense. This is really cool. So all it is, and, and it never hurts to reinforce the same thing. I mean, you know, I've talked a lot about don't mail the people that ignore you tonight. Um, and if I just sent one email about that in the next year, I would be doing my audience a disservice. I need to reinforce that fact. I need to hammer it home because people won't get it the first time. I might have to describe it in different ways, different reasons, all that kind of thing. Um, so while the core message is the same, the way I deliver it is going to be different. So maybe, you know, if I, I'm going to send maybe I was doing daily emails, then I kind of fell off the wagon a bit and I've sent maybe only about four in April. Um, and, you know, maybe I've sent about four so far in May, but I'm getting back up. I'm going to do about three a week is what I'm thinking. So I'm going to be covering the same topic a couple of times every month about this. And it might be like, you know, I might wait a couple of weeks between them, but there's important stuff. It can always, always be be shared. You know, there's just so many things. You know, we, we are all experts in something. Um, and even if we run out of things to say there, we can just tell stories. I mean, you know, you can tell stories about anything. And you know, this is this is the, the interesting thing. When I started adding stories into the emails that I was sending, People started to reply saying, hey, I'm loving finding a bit more about you. I'm liking this. You know, because it's it's a slightly different kind of email. People like to be entertained. They like different stuff as well. There's just so many different ways of getting stuff out there. And going back to what Jason said originally about how, yes, it does take time and energy. Um, it does, but... You know, my experience and the experience of a lot of the clients I've worked with, then the return on that investment has always been massive. That's the that's the most important thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's and, you know, it's worth mentioning, too, just, you know, that there are platform, you know, the platforms that you use can help you figure out what where like how long before the drop off tends to be. Right. So, like, you know, Adrian, you mentioned 90 days. Like I have a client that you know, I've been working with on, uh, with on some reputation repair and we've identified that at 15 weeks is when all of a sudden his people just kind of flatten out, right? It's like there's, you know, there it's, <clears throat> we'll call it 20% to 17% to 15% and then like 9% from 15 weeks on. So 15 weeks is his, is his mark. If mm -hmm. they don't engage inside of 15 weeks or if, in, inside of 15 weeks, kick them off and then figure out if you can re-engage them later but don't keep at, don't don't keep it active, right? And so, and I know that obviously that's a mission suite thing, but I'm sure. I mean, every most other automation platforms, I'm sure, have to have that. So that's oh yeah, they, they they do, and that's you know, and and even though you know, a lot of the platforms do it, they don't necessarily do a great job. I've developed specific software that makes it a lot easier. Um, mm -hmm. That that's even better at that. But the thing is, it is it's about. Ideally, heading off at the pass before they've gone for too long. It's like something I learned in the last few months is that Microsoft, they now, so you know, if anyone who's using uh, Hotmail, Outlook.com, Microsoft 365, um, Microsoft runs all of those mailboxes and they consider those people to be unengaged if they haven't opened anything for just 15 days now. If yeah. you keep mailing people after that, Microsoft will see you as one of the bad guys. And, you know, in the past... You know, Google is still at about 30 days for that measure. And you'd say that you'll get away with it up to about 60 to 90 days. With Microsoft, I've seen the hard way now. And the best way you can actually look at this is look at the performance of your new signups to your list. And I was seeing that, you know, if someone has a good reputation, then they will get as much as 80% of their new contacts engaging within the first 14 to 30 days. But what I started seeing was that the Microsoft component of that list was going down to about 35 to 40 percent engagement because Microsoft were penalizing them for being very lax with their engagement management. Mm -hmm. As soon as these people started reducing the time of unengagement down to about 30 days and they were cutting people off at 30 days, guess what? Microsoft started to like them again and they were getting performance, they were getting better performance with their new signups. So this is one reason that managing your engagement matters so much. Because if you're spending money on paid for advertising, you're building your email list by spending money, you could either be reaching 40% of those people or you could be reaching 80% if you clean your act up and manage your engagement. Now, which would you prefer? I know which one I would do. So, you know, there's lots of reasons beyond the obvious kind of short-term gain is, it, you know, your reputation is everything in this world and the better you can manage that, the better. I think that's, you know, it just makes such a difference. 
So there are two more questions here that I want that, that I want to make sure that we touch on. Um, and uh, <clears throat> one goes back to Jason's original question. The, the first question that Jason asked about the difference between sales emails and marketing emails and, you know, like uh, cold or warm prospects and, uh, you know, kind of using being able to because technically speaking with this can spam laws, you're still with spam laws, you're still allowed to email cold emails you're just not supposed to do it through third parties and things like that right so how are we you how are we still using email for lead generation and then jared asked a question as well about uh about subject lines so you know best way to use subject lines to catch attention and whatnot which seems to kind of work pretty well um into uh, in, into that into that realm too so i know we're we're, we're at 10 we're at 10 minutes to three here uh in mountain time so i want to make sure that we get the we get these questions in uh at before we before we wrap up here so Okay, so let's talk about cold emails in particular, um, because a lot of people ask me how to deal with cold emails. Because the thing is, if you're using any kind of marketing platform like you know Mailchimp, Active Campaign, Keep, Campaign Monitor, doesn't matter, Mission Suite, yeah, we'll put that out. <laughs> big one for that. Shoot me now. Um, so any of those platforms, they will get very upset with you real quick if you start sending emails to people that haven't given you explicit permission. And here's why. If you, you, you can send emails out to people, but every single mailbox out there has got this big button that says report this as spam. And the only definition of spam that the mailbox providers care about is what the recipient deems it to be. So if someone receives something, they think it's spam, they click the spam button. In that moment, they are judge, jury, and executioner. So if you send out marketing emails to people that have given you permission, the highest spam complaint rate you're gonna see, according to all the benchmarks I've seen, is about one per thousand emails you send out. If you go above that, you're gonna get a slap on the wrist by your, e by your marketing provider. Uh, if you go too high above that they're going to shut you down i had one guy he sent out an email uh, he put a very rude word in the subject line he got a two percent spam complaint rate which is 20 times the acceptable limit they shut him down with no warning because the, the reason they have to do this is the email providers have to protect their reputation because you know we have our individual reputation um, but you know all of the platforms out there they have to maintain their own good reputation otherwise their emails won't get delivered and that's why they don't allow cold sales emails and that's why you have to use specialist platforms because there is a higher risk and this is why so when someone says well how do I send cold emails my answer is very very carefully because the thing you've got to do it doesn't matter what platform what the technology doesn't matter you've got to maintain your reputation because if you get too many spam complaints you're going to end up on block lists and if you're on a block list then every email that you send is going to struggle so you know normally it's about well, what can you get away with if you're sending thousands of marketing emails that have a good open rate and a low spam complaint rate you can probably send a, a good handful of cold emails in amongst there but as soon as you start sending more and more emails that you don't have permission to send to the people yeah absolutely some people are they really want what you're sending to them and they're going to engage but if the cost of that is too many spam complaints you're going to be in a lot of trouble and this is why you've got to be careful you know if you're buying lists uh, scraping off the internet whatever it is just because you've got a demographic that you think should want you you've got to be aware of the dangers of just engaging with them you know without any second thought yeah you can do it and there's there's platforms um you know, there's a few different ones um like woodpecker lemless yeah, woodpecker yeah you know outreach.io you know, all of those the way they work is they will actually they kind of they autopilot your own Microsoft 365 mailbox or your own G Suite mailbox, um, which is great. But if you get too many complaints with that, then you'll find that Microsoft and Google just shut you down instantly again. So again, the way these platforms work is they, they send a very low volume. You know, you, the days have gone where you couldn't just buy a list of 100,000 people and just blast it out in a couple of days because you're going to be, you know, you're going to be shut down. Last time I saw a client try to do that, I think it took them two and a half days before Google dropped their reputation from high to bad and their open rate went down through the floor again. Ouch. So, you know, yeah, it's still possible, but not at volume. You've got to do it a trickle yeah. at a time. Yeah. That's pretty much it. And, you know, I'm sure you've got a few other bits to add to that, Dean. Yeah, I think of it in terms of account-based marketing, right, it, versus just like this big blast of approach. So it's, it's a completely different approach to using marketing as a tool in your sales process. With account-based account -based marketing, you're very 
very targeted. Maybe you've purchased some intent data to show that people in that domain are searching for your stuff. You've got inside information and you're targeting that message is personal, it's one-to-one. -one. And it doesn't always work, but it's a, it's a much higher effective rate than just blasting. These people will fit our persona. We're just gonna blast the heck out of them. So don't, don't do it, right? Unless you have a really good effective account-based marketing strategy and don't just rely on email. Right, it folds back into that story, right? Maybe you've connected with them on LinkedIn, they've accepted your connection request, you've engaged with them there, you've grabbed their email and you've engaged with them there, and then you've picked up the phone because you know the phone still works, right? In this whole world of making sales. So that's where those those direct cold um, emails work in a bit in a more integrated process, but blasting them out, as Adrian said, it's it's a recipe for pain and anguish. What about subject lines? Any uh, any quick tips on subject lines? The shorter, the better. That's probably the first one that I'll come up with. You know, the the, the long subject lines are gone. Um, it's it, it's difficult because every audience it will be slightly different. Um, but it's about um, you know, assuming that you've done all the best practice to actually get into the inbox. The only thing that can then influence whether they're going to read your email or not is well, there's two things. There's the from name itself. Do they recognise you? And as long as you got that recognition, the other thing then is the subject line. Is that subject line going to generate enough curiosity that they're going to open that email? So it's got to be short, it's got to be sweet, it's got to be snappy, it's got to be sexy, it's got to give them a reason to open it. Um, and there's a few little kind of, you know, grey hat cheats that you can do. It's like once in a while you might just send a subject line where the subject line is just Dean or Ian or something like that. Um, and you just put someone's name in there or you could just put, hey, I mean, you know, Frank Kern is the master of this. He's done it for years, but he only does it every now and then. The rest of the time, then it's like, you know, it's about telling you what's in it for you, why you're going to get a benefit from opening that email. So try and make it about the benefit to them as much as possible, but the shorter, the better. Um, you know, the one that I've used that's worked really well, if people haven't opened for a while, I send them email that says, are you still there, Dean, or whatever it is. Um, and that works. But again, I couldn't send that every week. You've got to mix things up a bit. But, you know, in general, shorter, the better. Yeah, yeah. And you touched on something quickly, Adrian, and I don't want to just blow by it, is the from email is really important too. So avoid using the sales at, info at, generic at your domain. Use your name because you're trying to build that relationship and the likelihood of them opening it from a generic email versus your name goes up exponentially as well. So Yeah, to very much. Yeah, awesome. Well, gentlemen, this has been, I mean, we could probably go on for this for another couple hours or so, but you know, Adrian, where you are, I think it's like what, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock right now. So <laughs> 10 PM now, nearly bedtime. Yeah. Right. Right. So, uh, but thank you very, so much for being here. This has really been awesome. Uh, you know, so real quick, we'll just do kind of last thoughts, last takeaway, uh, that you want people to, to, to pull away from and then where people can, uh, can, can, can reach to you can, or where people can get a hold of you. Uh, Dean, and we'll start with you and then and pop over to Adrian. So, uh, Dean, last thoughts and where people can get a hold of you. Yeah. Last thoughts are email is only one of the tools in your tool bag, right? Any one tool can be only effective so much. So think about an integrated campaign and remember not everything's a sale. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, that's my takeaway. And people can just Google my name or Google vantage group Denver and you'll find me. I'm all over the place. Connect with me on LinkedIn and say hi. Awesome. Adrian, what about yourself? Last thoughts and uh, where people can get a hold of you. Sure. So yeah, the, the main thing is, you know, if, if you can, you will transform your performance by only sending emails to the people that are actually opening things. Um, plenty of other things uh, I'll quickly share in the chat for the people that are on the Zoom call right now, and I'll say it as well. If you go to deliverabilitydashboard.com slash checklist, Firstly, that's a great example of a lead magnet. Um, but secondly, if you actually sign up uh, for, the, for the checklist on there, then you'll get a 17 point checklist that explains all the things that matter if you wanna make it into the inbox and avoid the spam folder. Also find me on Facebook, facebook.com slash Adrian Savage. Um, always happy to answer as many questions as I can, point people in the right direction. Um, you know, Love getting the message out as much as possible. So awesome. that was it and yeah, just let it go. Thank you so much. And we'll get that link 
into the uh, into the description of the video on YouTube and uh, and in, on the on the Mission Fleet Facebook page as well. Um, so uh, so yeah, anybody that is watching this who wasn't on the who wasn't on the chat at the time, they'll still have, they'll still have access to this as well too. So, um, but both of you, thank you so much for being here. This has really been an awesome session. We've actually already gotten a lot of really cool feedback on this. So uh, cool. thank you so much, and uh, and I am looking forward to the next one. And until then. Cheers, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.